um, um, th th there's always a first. And I think given the mitigating circumstances um, with um, uh, the coronavirus outbreak, uh, we're making the most out of uh, what we're given. Um, and it's actually not that bad um, because it, 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 it is a good platform for meeting um, like-minded uh, people from across the globe. Um, and I'm privileged to see such um, a, a wonderful turnout. Um, so without further ado... Um, Can we close the videos, please, if you don't mind? Um, close the videos? Yeah, if you have got any... Uh, I haven't got any videos. Can oh. you see my presentation screen? Yes, everything's fine. The first slide, okay. So, um, uh, the, the, the topic of today's uh, meeting is about uh, treatment planning with a periodontist mindset. Now, uh, it's supposed to touch on um, uh, the periodontal classification um, set in 2017. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth um, uh, with regards to that because I think um, it, it's been covered a lot um, in the last two years um, and that's very fortunate for all of us. It's a departure from something that we've been used to since uh, the 1999 classification. Um, so uh, I will touch base on it, um, but what I'm going to do is present how I utilize it in my clinical practice uh, to give you an insight into um, what goes on in my head when I meet a patient. So um, aims and objectives are um, understanding the perio classification, uh, but it's not applying it, but it's understanding how to utilize it. Um, understanding how to alter diagnosis in response to treatment understand the different treatment strategies um, that could be uh, formulated um, uh, based on the diagnosis um, and understand when to utilize dental implants in patients with um, um, uh, uh, what we call periodontal patients or patients with history of attachment loss. Okay, so um, this is critical. Um, the main um, uh, notion in science or in fact in life is to name an entity and once you've named an entity then you can begin to work with it you can treat it you can uh, manage it you can monitor it but if you cannot name it then um, um, you cannot manage it and, and that is why periodontal classification is critical um, and it's it, to us it, it has a it has a, a research implication but it also has an implication to service delivery so it dictates the recall period. How often should you see a patient? Every three months, every six months, every year? Um, supportive therapy, what you do for the patients when you see them? Um, when to reevaluate them? When do you do a pocket chart? Is it after three months, after six months, after one year? Um, that that is, 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 a, is a critical notion in itself, and it's very unclear. It is not clear. Um, how we get remunerated, um, uh, sorry, re re remunerated. Um, is it based on the health of the patient or based on the transition of the patient? Or is it based on the diagnosis that they started off with? These are all critical things. And obviously it, it makes a big difference um, in terms of communicating to the patient um, um, how um, imperative it is for the patients to um, take our advice on board um, is clearly linked to their understanding of what they've got uh, and the way to do that is obviously naming the entity that they've got okay and then there's measures of quality um, uh, to to be able to um, uh, measure our performance in practice against the gold standard so this is why classification is important it's not a hassle it is not a hassle. It is a vital aspect to clinical practice and definitely to research. Now, this is the BSP's interpretation of the 2017 classification. And it's a very workable, useful um, um, uh, method of uh, uh, incorporating the new classification into clinical practice. However, um, I must um, draw your attention to the fact that it's based on the BPE um, coding. BPE coding is not a classification, okay? Um, it is just a method of designing how uh, to manage patients in practice. 
Um, for uh, uh, our, our lovely attendees this evening who are not based in the UK, um, you will be able to um, utilize this if you wish, but I would suggest that you um, adhere to um, the local periodontal society's interpretation of the classification. Um, uh, but this is what is uh, commonly used in the UK. Uh, it's uh, based on the BPE scoring, 0, 1, and 2, um, 3, and 4. Um, it, it does not mean if a patient's got a code of 0, 1, or 2, it doesn't mean that they actually have gingivitis. They could actually have periodontitis. Okay, um, it depends on um, no evidence of interdental recession. So if there's interdental recession, then they actually spill into the periodontal um, 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 uh, case definition uh, or the periodonti periodontitis case definition. Um, so th this, is, this is a key factor that's perhaps not clear if you just pick this out of the BSP uh, paperwork. They have alluded to it, it's there, but you've got to keep that in mind, okay? Um, I won't go into too much detail. This is available, um, and it basically allows you to look at the spread of the disease or the extent of the disease. Um, and also, um, it allows for the staging and the grading. So the staging is how severe, um, uh, severely affected the patient is, and the grading is how rapidly it's moving um, uh, and how rapidly it's affecting the patient, okay? Um, they have grossly simplified it to make it more accessible in busy clinical practice, okay? Um, if you want to look at the, the, the comprehensive classification, um, you, you, you can access um, the Journal of Clinical Periodontology um, and, and look at the issues relevant to uh, Europerio in 2007, uh, 2018, the supplements, and you'll be able to look at the details. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's um, uh, alluding to whether it is stable, whether the condition is st the, the the state uh, of periodontitis is stable, um, whether it's in remission, uh, uh, and whether it's unstable. So this is all new um, when compared to the older uh, classification. Now, don't worry if I'm running through this quickly. Um, I've got about 15 or 16 cases um, that I want to go through, uh, and that will allow you to flex your your your, your periodontal muscles and hopefully. Um, be able to uh, diagnose on the spot or um, have some information um, gathering skills that will allow you to uh, produce a diagnosis, okay? So the main differences um, um, are, one, um, that we are um, um, basically having to comment on staging and grading. Uh, we need to um, label the condition as um, uh, the activity of the condition. Uh, be it stable, in remission, or unstable. And we've got to allude to the risk factors, okay? So how did the patient end up in that way? Um, I, I, here they've missed out um, 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 uh, genetic uh, predisposition as well. So I would, I would um, touch base on that with your patients, okay? Um, so don't worry, we, we will go through this with, with some cases, uh, and it will help to... Um, um, consolidate your knowledge um, of, of uh, per, uh, the periodontal classification. Okay, so why did we stop using the older classification? Remember the chronic aggressive, um, something that we've lived with since 1999? Okay, so these are two slides at two different magnifications. Okay, so from two different patients. Slide number one, slide number two. Okay, now the slide on the left is from a patient diagnosed as having chronic periodontitis. The slide on the right is from a patient diagnosed with aggressive periodontitis. Okay, now if I magnify the left one, it will look similar to the right. No difference. Okay, so histologically, there's no difference between chronic and aggressive. So it seemed uh, convenient to label patients uh, as having chronic or aggressive periodontitis uh, because it gave us uh, the impetus to prescribe antimicrobials at the time of um, debridement. 
Uh, that's in the clinical sense, in day-to-day -day practice. Um, however, histologically, the patients are the same. The disease entity is the same. Uh, clinically, the disease entity looks the same. Um, if we look at a, a particular site that's affected, it's very difficult to tell whether the patient has aggressive or chronic periodontitis. We'd have to go to the history to find out. Okay. So that seemed a bit difficult. Now, this is a paper that I participated in in 2018, and it looked at blood biomarkers, okay? And it compared patients um, classed as chronic or aggressive periodontitis um, and compared them to periodontally healthy subjects. And surprise, surprise, the gingival inflammatory response is not reflected by obvious changes in blood immune subset frequencies, okay? So that in itself helps us to appreciate the transition from the old classification to the new one, okay? Um, so there's no basis um, on the, uh, 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 of distinction between chronic and aggressive periodontitis clinically, uh, humoral response is the same. Uh, the blood cell, uh, the, the, the blood uh, subtypes are the same, and also histologically they look the same. So I think we'd all agree that dropping chronic and aggressive would be a good starting point, um, and I welcome that with a um, 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 uh, great deal of excitement. Also, the fact that. Uh, now, if we go back to the flow chart, now we've got scope to classify gingival health. This is a very, very critical new development, okay? Um, and it means that every patient walking through the door needs a periodontal classification, whether or not they've got disease, okay? So if they're healthy, they need a classification, okay? Um, uh, these are the new, the new changes. Now, it's interesting, this event where the 2017 classification was announced in 2018 in Amsterdam was fantastic. Amsterdam is, is, is known to have a lot of debauchery, a lot of distractions. However, that uh, conference pulled in a great deal of delegates who were very focused and very keen on grabbing as much information as possible. Um, and um, um, I, I, I'm happy to announce that I didn't um, uh, hear of, of them frequenting the um, local Amsterdam playgrounds. Um, they were just focused on the new classification. Right, so could you just for a minute think to yourself, what is periodontitis to you? Is it a pocket depth of more than three and a half, four, five, six, whatever the number you're using in your country? Or is it evidence of bone loss on one tooth, one surface of a tooth, more than one tooth, a seven next to an eight? You'll, you'll, I think you'll be, you'll be hard pressed to actually pinpoint what the definition of periodontitis is. And this is an age old problem in periodontal research. Okay, so for them to come up with a classification of periodontitis was critical, but also to define periodontitis. And this is one of the aspects of the BSP classification that was kind of skimmed or not, not, not addressed in detail. I would like to spend a few minutes on that. Okay, so periodontitis is interdental clinical attachment loss, clinical attachment loss B meaning bone loss or recession that is detectable at two or more non-adjacent teeth, okay? Two or more non-adjacent teeth. And that gives a threshold to overcome accidental injury or even non-accidental injury with whatever, you know, TP brush or whatever, okay? Or buccal or oral clinical attachment loss greater than or equal to three millimeters plus pocketing greater than three millimeters that is detectable at two or more non-adjacent teeth. Again, um, it's giving a bigger threshold to capture as much um, 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 uh, cases as possible and to protect our patients, okay? So clinical attachment loss detectable at two or more non-adjacent teeth or 
buccal oral clinical attachment loss. Now that could be a pocket or gingival recession plus pocketing greater than three millimeters. Therefore, if we extrapolate that to a BPE, that would be a BPE of three, um, uh, detectable at two or more non-adjacent teeth. So P BPE of three or more, detectable at two um, or more non-adjacent teeth, okay? So it goes on to say, the clinical attachment loss cannot be ascribed to causes other than periodontitis, such as gingival recession of traumatic origin, dental caries extending into the cervical area of the tooth, so the classic 70, 80-year-old um, patient um, with Sjogren's disease, for example, Sjogren's syndrome, or on uh, multiple uh, medication um, leading to xerostomia. Um, Can you hear me, Fahad? Yeah, I can. Okay. Can everyone hear me or? Yeah, I'm back online. Yes, you are. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, where did I lose um, connection? Gingival recession and elderly people. Seriously. Okay, so um, dental caries extending into the cervical area of a tooth leading to attachment loss, that cannot be called periodontitis, okay? The presence of clinical attachment loss on the distal aspect of second molar, so the classic seven in close uh, proximity to an eight, um, leading to attachment loss on the distal aspect, that cannot be periodontitis, um, even if all the bone's been lost, okay? Because there's a direct cause, a direct anatomical cause leading to that, and it's not an inflammatory um, uh, cause. Endodontic lesions draining through the marginal periodontium, such as with a vertical root fracture, that is not periodontitis. Okay, so that's greatly simplified life. Um, and it, it, it's, it's making it very, very clear. So um, I hope that's shed some light as to what periodontitis is. Now, Using that BSP flowchart, you would be able to describe um, um, the spread of um, uh, the lesions in the mouth. So is it localized or is it generalized? Or is it in size or molar distribution? You'll be able to um, uh, ascribe a um, stage uh, to it. Is it um, one, two, or three? And uh, a grade to it. Is it A, B, or C, depending on how rapidly it's moving? Um, and Moreover, based on the bleeding, based on the general risk factors, you'll be able to decide as to whether it's stable, whether it's in remission, i.e. it could turn, or whether it's unstable, so it's, um, it's raging and it needs treatment. Okay? Um, and you'll be able to look at the case and decide um, uh, whether it's a, a, a case of periodontitis or not. Okay, so uh, briefly, um, the staging is based on tumor classification. Um, some might disagree because it's an inflammatory condition and it's very difficult to use um, a, a tumor or an oncology mindset to um, define it. However, it's useful. Um, uh, the only problem I've got with it is uh, one, two, and three don't sound as punchy as you've got aggressive, um, severe periodontitis, for example. Um, the staging reflects the severity of the periodontal case, so um, um, how much bone is lost on the worst affected tooth. Uh, grading reflects the potential rate for the progression. Um, and again, you know, saying A, B, and C is not as punchy as saying aggressive. Okay, So if you refer patients to me, you would still get uh, in my letters, and the patients still get in my letters, the old classification with the new one in brackets. So the 1999 classification um, um, and the new one in brackets, because I believe the nomenclature of the old classification is a lot more punchy and helps to um, uh, drive home the need for help. Okay, And the extent reflects the distribution, basically, in the mouth. And we're required to make a comment on the risk 
Um, and again, that is part and parcel of making sure that we've got one concise statement that describes the patient and drives home the need for change. Um, so be it genetics, be it um, weight, like obesity, although that's a tricky one to discuss with some patients, um, smoking, um, um, and a genetic predisposition. Um, so it's critical to understand that and to try and relay it as much as possible in the definition. Okay, so this would be um, easily accessible from um, the actual staging and um, grading and periodontal classification paperwork or papers that were published um, as a supplement to the Europerio 2018 conference. You can easily access them um, um, from um, Journal of Clinical Periodontology webpage. They are not password protected, okay? Um, in the UK, we are sticking to radiographic bone loss as a measure um, and we're avoiding all of this. Now, just a, a, just a background note, you will find that stage three and stage four are largely similar. It's very difficult to find a difference between them. But stage four was identified as a separate column purely to relay the need for multidisciplinary treatment. Okay, so treatment that is periodontal plus um, surgical, for example. Okay. Um, and you, you can see that from the descriptions here uh, of the complexity, okay? So if you're classing someone as stage four, they're likely to need multidisciplinary help, okay? Which you may be able to provide uh, under one roof or you may be able to, or you may need to enlist a number of people like an orthodontist, for example, um, uh, to manage drifting and flaring, um, an oral surgeon, for example, uh, um, uh, to, to look at um, uh, dental implants and rehabilitation or a periodontist um, to look at periodontal surgery or a combination uh, depending on the condition, okay? Or certainly replacement of uh, uh, missing teeth, okay? Um, and the extent and distribution, again, it's, it's to, to drive home the complexity of the disease, how many teeth are affected, and how difficult it is to manage this patient, okay? The grading... Again, this is from uh, the um, uh, Europerio supplement papers. Uh, in the UK, we are focusing on bone loss, the ratio of bone loss by age, okay? So a grade C is largely one that is very rapid, okay? A condition that's very rapid. Um, um, so to give you an example, 30% bone loss in a 30-year-old will be a grade C. 30% bone loss, in a 70-year-old is definitely not a problem, so it's a grade A, or it's less of a problem, okay? There are other aspects um, um, in, 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 the, in the, uh, the, the diagnostic criteria, but to simplify things and to keep it streamlined and quick for busy um, UK practitioners, uh, the BSP has decided to focus on this column, which is sensible. Uh, now, grade modifiers or risk factors, um, these help, okay? Now, there's a departure from the use of percentages in HB1AC, that is the glycated hemoglobin. Um, so, hemoglobin in red blood cells um, um, can get glycated, it can attract um, 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 sugar, um, and the percentage of glycated hemoglobin gives a reflection of how well controlled a diabetic patient is. Okay, um, so if their glycated hemoglobin is greater than or equal to seven, they're largely poorly controlled. Most general medical practitioners um, run uh, uh, diabetic patients above seven. Okay, um, uh, 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 patients um, get this confused with the extent of blood sugar control or the random blood sugar. Uh, this is a reflection of how well controlled in the preceding three months to the test. Okay, so this gives you like an average, if you like. Okay, um, so that's a, a better marker. If you're interested, you need to write to, your, um, to the patient's medical practitioner requesting this test. 
um, and it helps you identify how well controlled the patient is. Um, but patients often get this number confused for their random blood sugar, okay? Um, so I wouldn't trust asking the patients. Um, Miscellaneous classifications um, uh, uh, presented in uh, Europario uh, or in that 2017 classification document is occlusal trauma. This is very useful, very useful. They've added orthodontic, okay? So it's primary, uh, where there's been no attachment loss. Secondary, where there's been attachment loss. Um, so there'll be a case periodontitis um, uh, at that stage or orthodontic. Um, so during orthodontic tooth movement, there is by and large an increase in mobility of, of, of a tooth, which is often transient. So it's nice to be able to give it a name now um, and allay fears uh, that patients often present with when um, they're, they're, they're having orthodontic treatment. Uh, systemic disease um, affecting periodontal tissues, uh, that hasn't changed. It was present in the 1999 classification and still is. Um, uh, tooth and prosthesis. So this is the invasion of biological width um, or invasion of the supracrestal attachment. That is the new technical term for it. Um, we're not really using invasion of biologic width anymore. So invasion of supracrestal attachment um, um, and gingival deformity or recession, okay? Um, and combined perioendo lesions, uh, they're featuring. Now, um, recession, that is from the document. It is very comprehensive, very complicated. Uh, my suggestion is rather than spending valuable clinical time looking at all of that, please just take a picture. Take a picture from a standardized, standardized position and that will help you define it as a mucogingival deformity and also um, note all the factors associated with it, okay? Um, now, this comprehensive list is lifted from research re uh, relating to gingival recession, okay? Um, I think it's, um, it's too cumbersome to include in, in, in dental practice. Um, if you have an intraoral scanner, they are brilliant, um, especially um, ones that allow you to track recession over time. Um, 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 Itero is the commonest one because it, it kind of, it's a good platform for Invisalign. Um, that seems to be useful and user-friendly to um, monitor recession. Um, uh, so if, you, if, you're, if you're scanning a patient for recession um, or for orthodontic treatment, it's useful. Now, it's worthy to note um, that in the, uh, in the next uh, Euro period, there'll be um, um, a number of discussions um, uh, like the previous one, looking at post-orthodontic recession, and that's becoming an increasing medical legal pressure on orthodontists. Regrettably, the British Orthodontic Society does not note or attribute gingival recession um, to orthodontic treatment. Um, and they're right, because we don't have any longitudinal papers that demonstrate a link. Most recession tends to appear um, uh, three to five years after recession. It's mostly localized around the lower centrals, lower in sizes in general, and the canines, uh, the upper canines and uh, uh, premolars. Um, certain uh, occlusal, um, uh, uh, certain malocclusal, malocclusions tend to predispose themselves more to gingival recession, but also the, the skeletal structure as well. A longer phase tends to have more recession. Um, so we don't know when to treat it. Is it before orthodontic treatment, in the middle of orthodontic treatment, or at the end? Um, and uh, particularly round tripping, that's very common with um, non-extraction orthodontics with Invisalign, for example, where teeth are proclined, then interproximal strippings undertaken or interproximal reduction, and then the teeth are retroclined again. That can lead to transient recession, which in the wrong person will lead to um, loss of attachment, okay? Um, I'll touch base, uh, I'll, 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 look, I'll discuss that briefly uh, in the cases to come, okay? But documenting recession is critical. Take a picture, please. Um, we have a number of hygienists in our, um, in our group uh, this evening. Um, it's a good way of um, maintaining um, a, 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 a strong link with the patients. If you demonstrate a picture every time they come in and you're tracking the tooth shade, for example, 
um, the, the, uh, the, the amount of staining, but also recession. So taking a picture at the initial meet and greet visit is very critical for dentists, but also for hygienists. Um, combined perioendo lesions, again, um, they have done a really fantastic job in identifying what could and could not be treated. So I would say a grade one is worth um, the effort of considering endodontic treatment. Okay. Um, as we go into grade two and grade three, the probability of um, um, uh, re-establishing clinical attachment drops considerably, okay? And a key note here, um, please do not debride the teeth after uh, undertaking endodontic treatment in the um, non-periodontitis patients because, they, by and large, the root surface would have viable stem cells, and if you start to debride the, the roots, you will lose these stem cells um, and the, 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 the probability of attachment gain goes, okay? But this is very useful. Um, Peri-implant health, uh, fantastically described, okay? Um, and very lenient in terms of the amount of bone loss. So absence of further bone loss following initial eating, which which not, will not be more than, more than or equal to two and a half millimeters. Very, very lenient, okay? Uh, pocket depth could differ uh, depending on the height of soft tissue. So I wouldn't ascribe the normal pocket depths that we're using for BPE scoring, for example, around teeth to be the same around implants. If an implant is placed in thick tissue or placed deeply, it will have a deep probing depth, okay? Uh, however, it should not be seen to increase over time. If it does, then it's not healthy. Okay, mucositis um, is, is um, uh, the absence of bone loss beyond the normal bone uh, level changes, okay, uh, resulting from initial uh, remodeling. So uh, the tissues, um, red, um, tissues can be swollen, you can have profuse bleeding, the probing depths could be increased. Uh, however, it's not reflecting with um, uh, increasing bone loss, okay? Um, and peri-implantitis, again, this is, this is a key definition. Uh, progressive radiographic bone loss compared to one year after loading. My problem with that has always been, what if the patient's new to the practice and they have older implants? Well, they've really helped here with this extension. So in the absence of initial radiographs and probing depths, um, a radiographic bone level greater than or equal to three millimeters should be seen as suspicious, okay? Um, and or um, uh, probing depths of greater than or equal to six millimeters, that should be seen as suspicious in the presence of bleeding. Now, all of the above are required. So it's not just this. So this, in the absence of bleeding, suppuration, um, will not be perimplantitis, okay? So this definition is actually quite relaxed um, and should be documented in detail in the notes. So um, if you're seeing a patient with um, uh, implants, um, I would uh, note the color of the tissue. I would note whether it's bleeding. I would note the presence of suppuration. I would note the pocket depths, and I would take an x-ray every year for the first four years. Uh, and this is my rule. It's not written anywhere. So for the first four years post-loading, um, and then after that, depending on the level of risk. Okay, so this is up to your clinical judgment. All right. Um, so with every encounter with a patient with implants, it's critical to note these uh, parameters, and that helps you to direct the patient appropriately. Okay, let's, let's take a break for a minute, and um, I'm going to go through some cases now, um, and I'm going to share uh, with you what goes on in my mind when I meet um, a, a, a patient that's referred, um, and I'm clinically examining them, okay? So, um, case number one, Okay, so let's assume this is a close-up image of uh, about four teeth, um, and 
Assume the rest of the mouth, please, is the same as this, okay? So what am I seeing here? I'm seeing uh, no evidence of interproximal attachment loss. I'm seeing thick um, uh, tissues with, without evidence of buccal um, uh, clinical attachment loss or minimal evidence of clinical attachment loss. Tissues are pink. I'm not seeing any um, uh, uh, plaque retentive factors. And um, uh, if, we, if we say that I'm probing, um, I go around probing the soft tissues, um, no probing depths greater than four millimeters. So in my mind, this is a clinically healthy case. Okay, this is a clinically healthy case. All right, so that, that's what goes on in the notes. Um, whether or not they need any dental treatment is a different matter. Okay, uh, this is new. We were not used to defining health before the new classification. And it's critical that we get used to it. Okay. Case number two. Now, when I'm going through these cases, I'm actually taking a tour of older cases that have managed in practice. Okay. My thoughts have changed a lot. And I know a, a good friend of mine now is listening, um, um, uh, Andrew Cobbin, up in Inverness. Um, we both went to Glasgow together, and we were both tutored by uh, a professor, Stephen Creener. And he gave me a, a, a valuable uh, a bit of advice many, many years ago that I'm strongly adhering to now. Um, and it's basically this. And please... Um, uh, I hope it's of benefit to you as well. When you first start off looking at something or doing something, you're likely to be making mistakes, but the dangerous thing is you won't know that you're making mistakes. Then you go on to a next level where you're actually seeing the mistakes happen, but you can't change them. And the level after that is you've mastered a certain amount of um, clinical acumen um, that you're able to change these mistakes and correct them. And the final level is that you can see the mistakes about to happen and you stop them, okay? Now, this is roughly before you retire, okay? So I'm at probably level three now. I will take a tour with you. I'll show you some of the cases where I've made mistakes um, and the new classification is just helping shape how we look at patients now. Um, and it's going to drive a few changes in clinical practice. Um, and that will be particularly pertinent to implant dentistry in the periodontal cases, okay? So, for example, let's look at this, let's look at this case. Now, this is a, this is a classic case of um, um, inflammation, okay? So there's interproximal attachment loss, quite clearly. There's um, facial or um, buccal surface attachment loss. Okay, um, and if we go back to the periodontitis case definition, it's affecting two or more non-adjacent teeth. There, 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 okay. Um, florid pocketing. Now, what do we need to know about this patient? We need to know the medical history, um, any risk factors in the medical history. I need to know as well what her family history is like. Um, uh, uh, is there any evidence of a clear um, um, clearly, um, um, uh, of clear tooth loss due to periodontitis, such as loss of mobile teeth, for example, in the parents, um, that's a clear cut marker. Uh, mobile teeth are highly associated with clinical attachment loss. Um, so, and then I need radiographs to see um, the, the stage that she's at. So I know she's a periodontitis case, um, and um, by taking a radiograph, I'll know what stage she's at. I prefer to take full root length road radiographs, um, and that will help me decide um, uh, basically the, the stage. But also, if I know her age, and I know how much bone she's lost on the radiograph, then I'll know the grading, how rapidly it's moving in her case, okay? Um, and then that will help me drive the treatment. Um, 
And it so happened in her case that she was a case periodontitis because of the interproximal attachment loss and the facial uh, attachment loss. Um, she had greater than uh, 30% of her teeth in a generalized sense with attachment loss. So that makes her a generalized case. Um, she had lost more than 70% um, of bone. So that makes her a stage four. Um, and um, she's, she was only 40 years of age. So that makes her a grade C. So now we're taking, it's taking shape. There's lots of bleeding here. Her, her uh, uh, full mouth bleeding score is greater than 10%. So that makes her an unstable patient. So now you can see I'm just piecing together the definition, the, 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 the case definition for this patient. Um, and she is a generalized, unstable, 4C periodontitis with a familial history of um, uh, tooth loss, therefore a possible genetic predisposition. She's a non-smoker and she's not a diabetic. Okay. Um, so therefore, based on that, um, I... And based on the amount of debris I'm seeing around the teeth and the generalized sense of inflammation, uh, non-surgical debridement is critical here. Okay, So full mouth non-surgical debridement in a short window of 24 hours with antimicrobial cover produces a very nice result. Okay, So there's lots of recession reflective of the amount of um, bone loss that was evident on her x-rays. Okay, um, this patient was beautifully maintained post treatment with the hygienist. Um, uh, so on a weekly, on a week, uh, sorry, on a uh, on a fortnightly basis for a month, and then a review about eight uh, eight weeks later. Um, and uh, lo and behold, um, thank God for her, um, all the pockets had had resolved. Okay, um, and she can go on to maintenance now because of her grading. That won't change. And because of her staging, it won't change. So she's still a high-risk patient. She may have a, 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 a diagnosis that's, that could be redefined as generalized because of the extent of attachment loss, the spread of attachment loss, um, stable because of the control of risk factors, um, 4C because the amount of bone loss and her age are unchanged, periodontitis because she's got attachment loss um, uh, on, on two or more non-adjacent teeth, um, uh, she's still a high-risk patient. So therefore, she's on maintenance every three months with the hygienist forevermore because that diagnosis will never change. Okay, another case. So this is a case um, that would have benefited a lot from um, the new classification, but it was treated um, a, while, a while ago just by pure instinct. So what, what we can see here um, is a, a patient in her 50s, um, fit and well, long history of smoking over 20 a day, uh, no family history of tooth loss due to mobility, highly stressed. Um, husband had several um, 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 uh, cancers uh, that she was, um, and, and she's, she's the sole carer. Um, um, she has lost teeth um, due to hypermobility. And that's critical to note in the history. It's always important to ask why they've lost teeth. Because if she's lost teeth due to hypermobility, therefore, that at some point in the past, we could assume that she had over 70% bone loss or even 100% bone loss on a tooth. And that automatically gives her a stage of four. Okay, a stage of four and probably a grade of C because she can, um, she's definitely less than 100 years old. So, um, so all of a sudden now, looking at this x-ray, even without pocket, uh, a pocket chart, I can tell you that she's a generalized case because of the number of uh, teeth with uh, attachment loss. She's definitely got periodontitis because there's, there's attachment loss on more than two non-adjacent teeth. Um, she's um, uh, got a stage four, definitely, because of the amount of bone loss on the upper molars. Um, She's, uh, she's a grade C because she's in her 50s and she's lost more than 70 or even 100% bone loss on the teeth that were lost due to hypermobility plus the upper molars. So all of a sudden, this patient is a very high risk 
and she's also high risk because she smokes, okay? She smokes a lot. So um, uh, this case definition will not change even if I take the poorly affected teeth. If I extract the poorly affected teeth, the upper molars, it will not change. Whereas with the older classification, it may have changed. Okay? That's a critical difference. Now, by instinct, she was treated about five years ago. And if I'd adopted the common high street uh, approach of saying, well, the posterior molars are hopeless um, um, and the anterior teeth, uh, well, they don't look very attractive. How about um, uh, we extract all your teeth and give you four implants in the premaxilla with an immediate load bridge and we call this tooth in a day and hey, you get to start again um, and you don't have periodontitis anymore. But according to the new classification, she's still got periodontitis even if you take her teeth away because one of her teeth was lost due to hypermobility. And in the presence of good clinical records, we can see from the x-ray the extent of bone loss and that will not change. She's still got periodontitis. Um, even if you take the teeth away, okay, uh, she's still a case periodontitis and therefore she's at high risk of peri-implantitis. Um, so she was actually treated with bilateral sinus augmentation, two implants and a shortened dental arch. Okay, and lots of soft tissue augmentation to maintain the thick uh, tissue biotype. And that's her stable um, after uh, four years. And naturally, she quit smoking altogether. Okay, we pushed hard. We refused to treat her until she quit smoking. Um, I know she's going to end up losing bone around the implants. Um, and that is a factor that will stay with us because of her case definition of periodontitis. Now, in this day and age, I would have probably leaned more towards using shorter implants um, because if she did lose bone um, uh, through peri-implantitis, then it's just easy to replace the implants without having to look at complex augmentation uh, in, in the posterior maxilla. So that's what I learned. Um, and that's how my outlook is different now, uh, particularly given the uh, recent data coming out from Europe, actually not recent anymore, it's, it's, it's quite well established that shorter implants survive as, as, as well as uh, longer implants. So let's look at this case. Now, um, again, we can see some severe bone loss around the posterior teeth. Um, if we go back to, um, uh, it's no different from the previous case, um, we've got close proximity of the lower left seven and eight with some attachment loss. That will not be a basis for periodontitis case definition. The basis here for periodontitis case definition is the number of non-adjacent teeth with clinical attachment loss. So that tells us that this patient has periodontitis there, 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 um, and virtually everywhere actually. Um, the extent of uh, bone loss is highest on this tooth. That's above um, or at 70%. So that makes this patient a um, um, stage four. Um, she is in her 50s. With that amount of bone loss, she would be a ratio of greater than one um, of bone loss, percentage bone loss over age. So that makes her C, okay? Um, and she was just simply treated with um, extraction of that and non-surgical debridement with antimicrobials, okay? Now, notice regeneration of bone. So, technically speaking, if we didn't know that this tooth was removed due to periodontal reasons, one would actually have to redesign the diagnosis here. So, revise the diagnosis. So she could be generalized because of the number of teeth with attachment loss. Um, she could be stable at this stage because by and large, with that amount of uh, bone regeneration, her uh, parameters, the clinical parameters would be good. Um, the maximal amount of bone loss here is around about 50%. So she could actually be a three, stage three. Um, and uh, uh, grade B, um, and um, we can make a note about her risk factors, and she would be stable, 
Okay, so this is an example of how to um, change the diagnosis as the patient's moving through the treatment. Okay, so it's okay to revise the diagnosis. Right, a big question here, is this periimplantitis? Now, if you remember the case definition of periimplantitis involved bone loss, and there's clear bone loss here. There's no pocketing, there's no bleeding on probing, there's no suppuration. So this is not periimplantitis, even though the threads are exposed. It could just be remodeling. Okay, so it's important not to look at the amount of bone loss around the implants in isolation, but to take the whole clinical presentation and to remember that bleeding, suppuration, the color of the tissues, erythema, for example, are critical to be combined along with evidence of bone loss in order to say that a patient has perimplantitis. Okay, now again, is this perimplantitis? Now I've got, I've lifted a flap here, but that's the clinical presentation. Okay, there is bone loss, but clinically, no bleeding, no suppuration, no erythema. There's recession, so there's evidence of bone loss, but it's actually just remodeling, remodeling of the buccal plate, which can continue after loading an implant, okay? Um, so the management of this would be purely aesthetic, okay? Not actually a management of inflammation. So she was managed with a connective tissue graft, actually multiple connective tissue grafts, two in order to get this result, um, and quite stable. Okay, now, this is quite clear that it's periodontitis because of the uh, evidence of bone loss on two or more non-adjacent teeth. Um, it's generalized because it's more than 30% um, of the teeth affected. It is, I can tell you it's unstable because her mouth was um, uh, uh, really inflamed with a, a lot of bleeding and probing. Um, and uh, it's definitely a stage four because it's greater than 70% uh, of bone loss. Um, it is um, a grade C because actually this patient is 45 years of age. And the main risk factor here is not medical, it is stress she manages the, uh, the delivery network, or she used to manage the delivery network of Tesco's uh, about six or seven years ago. So um, highly stressful uh, uh, role. And she was managed with non-surgical debridement, periodontal surgery and regeneration, but definitely not a case for implants if it can be avoided. And you can see here that I've splinted teeth together, I've resected teeth, I'm really avoiding implants here uh, because she's very young and the risk of periimplantitis is very high. Um, and this is a resin retained bridge, very ambitious resin retained bridge, but it served her well. So it's so easy just to give her some implants, but with her age and her uh, um, diagnosis, which will not change even if the poorly affected teeth are removed, she's likely to get periimplantitis and whoever manages her aggressively by having teeth removed very early in her life will be to, to blame for any failures, okay? Particularly given this new diagnosis, uh, the, the, the new classification. Now, um, quick point here. Um, uh, this is a safety netting uh, um, a slide. Um, is this periimplantitis, uh, sorry, is this um, a periodontitis? The answer is no, because the inflammation, the amount of uh, inflammation passes the, the mucogingival junction, okay? So if you find erythema passing the mucogingival junction, this is likely to be an oral medicine case. And it actually turned out to be Crohn's disease in a child, okay? Um, so this is not gingivitis, not purely gingivitis. And you'll find there's lots of plaque, lots of inflammation on the teeth, and you'll keep asking the patient to brush, 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 um, but it won't go away and it'll bleed uh, considerably and look angry. Um, there's often a, um, 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 uh, an oral medicine or a medical issue uh, here that needs to be looked at. It's not just purely gingivitis or periodontitis. Um, the commonest um, uh, issue is um, a lichenoid or lichen planus uh, reaction, which causes lots of bleeding, 
uh, lots of plaque accumulation, um, even in the presence of um, uh, well attempted home care. Um, um, these cases are not associated with attachment loss because of the mucogingival condition. Um, it, it, it's just a presentation, okay? So an oral medicine opinion here would be warranted, okay? Um, again, if we look at this case, lots of attachment loss, lots of anterior drifting of the teeth, uh, attachment loss over 90%. Now this is reaching the terminal stage uh, in the upper arch with only two viable units, the canines, and even this canines lost so much attachment. Now, I'm snookered here. I cannot logically use these teeth. The patient had uh, a chrome um, and has a lot of phobia. Um, and we worked with her um, uh, uh, requests. We worked with her uh, primary concerns. Um, and in this case, I would say, yes, it's a good idea to move on to implants, given her um, current dental condition and her inability to tolerate a denture. Uh, dentures are not great for periodontal cases, um, so we should try and avoid them as much as possible. Use of uh, simple resonating bridges is a good idea, but if we're snookered, then dental implants. Now, uh, she was managed post um, um, uh, the change in classification. And if you note, there's ample cleaning here, ample space for cleaning. This is lovely um, um, all on four um, bridge work constructed by my um, uh, good friend Paul Dumpleton in uh, Smile Design uh, in Rochester with plenty of clearance for cleaning. I don't care about the exposed um, uh, uh, abutment interface with the bridge. Uh, it's not a concern for me. The main thing is the amount of cleaning, okay? And then in the opposing arch, some definitive periodontal work uh, was undertaken as such, okay? So a resection here um, and uh, um, some uh, regeneration here um, um, uh, 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 and debridement in the lower arch. Now notice I used, a, a, wherever possible, I tried to keep the implants upright um, because I'm anticipating some bone loss at some point, try to keep the implants short uh, and as narrow as uh, possible to achieve the prosthetic result, okay? Um, so that I don't overstress the ridge. And of course, this ridge was augmented even though I had sufficient bone because I'm anticipating problems in the future. Um, uh, now, um, the discerning uh, members of the audience would probably comment on how uh, the distal cantilever is, is large, uh, but that's because of the free end saddle at the back. Um, we can afford to do something like that. Um, um, and it, 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 it fitted well with her smile. Okay, so her diagnosis of severe, um, um, unstable was changed to stable um, for C continues to be 4C, uh, periodontitis continues to be periodontitis, okay? Um, and the risk factors were actually managed in her case. Um, she um, um, unfortunately lost her mother. Uh, she was a long-term care for her mother and stress levels reduced considerably, okay? And this is, a, this is quite a stable result at year two now. Okay, so that's how the new classification is shaping how we look at management. Okay, um, now, lots of recession here, post-orthodontic treatment with interproximal attachment loss. Because of the interproximal attachment loss, this is the case periodontitis. So therefore, even though smile line is low, we should be doing something to manage this recession because this patient is likely to be losing further attachment in the years to come. Um, moreover, he smokes. So he was managed with soft tissue grafts, okay, um, to achieve root coverage. And we're trying to reestablish health, uh, reestablish attachment in anticipation for future loss, particularly given his age and his work, okay? Um, this patient is different, okay? So this is recession around really nicely placed veneers, okay? So this is not a case of periodontitis. There's no attachment loss in between the teeth. 
And the decision to treat this is purely aesthetic. So we're not worried about future attachment loss. Okay? So that, that was just simply managed with soft tissue grafts, with connective tissue grafts. All right? But the decision here is aesthetic. It's not a health-based decision. Okay? Again, there's a composite restoration here. There's been evidence of um, uh, tooth surface loss due to uh, uh, erosion and associated recession. Okay, so this is a mucogingival deformity, probably secondary to tooth surface loss and was camouflaged poorly with a composite restoration. The correct decision here is a new composite restoration and a connective tissue graft. Okay, particularly, and I would only treat this because of the lip line, it was highly exposed, okay? This is not periodontitis. Again, it's a seven in close conjunction, uh, in close uh, proximity to an eight, an impacted eight. This is not periodontitis anymore. We don't need to worry about this, okay? Only if um, there's evidence of caries um, um, or there's attachment loss here and this wisdom tooth becomes um, a problem in terms of being in line of the periodontal surgery. Okay, now we've got, this is an implant tooth, okay, with extensive bone loss, suppuration, sinus. This is a UNC15 probe, and it's going up to about eight millimeters. Reflected, and a flat reflection demonstrates the amount of bone loss. This is a, periodont a periimplantitis case, and it's a severe case, okay? But radiographically, it actually doesn't look that bad. It does not look that bad. So all the factors must be noted in order to say it's a case periodontitis, a per periimplantitis. So a small amount of bone loss here from the platform of the implant. It's a Nobel implant. So there's more than three millimeters of bone loss. Probing depth greater than six millimeters in the presence of suppuration and a draining sinus. This is a periimplantitis case. Lift the flap. Lo and behold, that's quite clear. And it was treated with uh, augmentation, and that's a result at one year. Okay. Now, these are becoming increasingly common. Okay, this is a calcium channel blocker. Um, I think it was amlodipine. Um, and we'll see it a lot more. So this is a, a drug-related gingival overgrowth. And it was treated with a resection and, and um, a new provisional crowns. Now, you're likely to see this in the anterior sextants, and particularly in close conjunction to um, areas with plaque retention. Um, this is another uh, case that was managed with just um, changing um, the medication. Okay, so just changing the calcium channel blocker to another antihypertensive uh, with some really good um, um, uh, non-surgical debridement by a hygienist. And the, the results are, are pretty impressive. Okay, um, this is another case. Um, again, I would treat this differently. Now, notice the size of the implants used to replace the hopeless units. Um, I would probably lean more towards using shorter implants given the patient's risk, okay? Um, shorter, thinner implants. However, my use of this tooth by hemisecting it and turning it into a, a single unit and minimizing the number of implants would still continue, okay? So the idea is, one, try and avoid implants as much as possible in um, uh, pa patients with a defined case of periodontitis, be it unstable or stable. Um, and if we cannot, um, uh, then to minimize the use of, uh, um, uh, then to, 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 to try and um, use uh, the maximal number of implants in, in, in the bounded saddle and to keep them as short as possible um, uh, without over-traumatizing the range, okay? Um, so going by this approach, I would have probably been better off putting a resin-retained bridge here rather than a dental implant, okay? However, the patient's done well um, with full mouth periodontal surgery, implants, treatment of this perioendo lesion. Um, however, um, given the new classification, 
um, and how we're seeing patients over, over time, um, it is important to use shorter implants where possible because they're likely to lose uh, uh, more bone over time. So I would say uh, no more than um, 10 millimeter implants. Uh, narrow where possible, uh, platform switching uh, would help to preserve um, uh, bone and minimize remodeling around these shorter than normal or than traditional implants. Um, and also try and utilize bridges, uh, non-invasive bridges like resin retained bridges more. Um, and try and utilize the teeth as well as much as possible. So this is, um, uh, this is a hemisected tooth. That would be the correct approach that I would continue with. Um, this lovely um, a restoration um, constructed by um, my, my good friend, um, uh, Paul Dumpton at, at, at Smile Design. Um, again, similar approach, as I said before, minimizing the number of implants used. So technically speaking, it would have been nice just to place an implant in the lateral zone here and here and have a four unit bridge that would give the ideal curvature uh, of aesthetics, but uh, we're sticking to uh, the, the case definition. This patient will always have periodontitis, even if I treat all the pockets, uh, even if all the uh, teeth with advanced bone loss are removed. Um, therefore, we're anticipating bone loss. Therefore, it's best to use um, uh, 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 as short as possible implants, um, um, uh, but not exceeding 10 millimeters, um, uh, narrow where, where, where possible, so not to over traumatize the ridge, augment the ridge uh, if possible, um, and try and preserve as many teeth as possible um, and utilize implants only when uh, minimal resin retained bridges uh, are not possible. And definitely try and avoid dentures because they will expedite tooth loss. And our last case here. Again, this is nicely defined. This is a tooth prosthesis issue. So this is the invasion of supercrestal attachment. It's a poorly uh, placed margins, um, quite rightly spotted by my good friend, Amy Holder. Um, she's referred this patient to uh, uh, my attention. Um, he actually didn't have um, a florid attachment loss. Um, it's just interproximally here um, and, and, and nowhere else. So therefore, he doesn't fit the case definition for periodontitis. This is only between um, one tooth um, uh, in, in one interproximal area rather than between two non-adjacent teeth. Uh, probing depths were not um, uh, greater than four millimeters. There's lots of signs of inflammation. Uh, crowns were removed and uh, naturally there was a lot of secondary caries. Um, uh, that was all managed. Uh, this tooth, unfortunately, was hopeless. So um, we utilized a, a dental implant here rather than a cantilever bridge um, because um, um, he's not a periodontitis case. Um, it, it would be best to uh, avoid cantilevers um, um, and lean more on implants. Um, and that's the result. Um, um, uh, quite healthy soft tissues um, um, and, and a well-integrated um, uh, Megagen implant. This was an immediate load uh, implant. And if, if you note, I used a long implant. Again, this is not a case periodontitis. Therefore, I'm not worried about future attachment loss uh, and severe vertical defects uh, resulting in an already damaged, uh, periodontally damaged ridge. Uh, so in this case, um, I opted for immediate load, uh, immediate implant, uh, to try and achieve the highest, po uh, highest possible primary stability um, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the restoration. Um, thank you for supporting us this evening and thank you for uh, sparing some time to join us. I'm sorry I went over a little bit. Um, thank you to Paul at Smile Design, um, uh, uh, my long associate um, uh, lab technician, who's uh, been instrumental in a lot of my cases. Um, and thank you to all the teams and all the practices that um, um, I serve. Um, uh, I know some of you are listening this evening. Uh, thank you for uh, joining. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fahad. Very interesting talk. Uh, a lot of uh, controversial topics and great areas in periodontology, which I think it might worth uh, doing another webinar part sometime, if you can, because I think there are a few uh, areas, and we have got a few questions from the audience here. I'm going to go through the questions, um, if you may. Yeah. 
Uh, first question from Dr. Omar in Edinburgh, Scotland, asking about the effectiveness of adjunctive antimicrobial therapy, especially I think the first or the second phase, which uh, used uh, antimicrobial therapy along with surgical management. So basically, if you can allude on the importance of and the effectiveness of adjunctive antimicrobial therapy, especially with aggressive cases. Okay. Um... I'm going to divide this and I'm going to divide my answer into two phases, okay, or two timelines, right? So there's the pre-2019 and then there's the post-2019. Okay, so pre-2019, uh, it was clear that use of um, antimicrobials as an adjunct to uh, antimicrobial therapy is well established in the old aggressive classification, okay? Um, and uh, it, 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 it greatly um, uh, uh, reduced the, the number of residual pockets over uh, six millimeters at reassessment. Okay, so that's in the aggressive cases. Uh, now we've lost that case definition. Uh, and moreover, in 2019, um, uh, that heralded a new paradigm in, in non-surgical treatment using endogame in a flapless approach. And that now is beginning to show the same kind of results as um, 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 supplementing non-surgical treatment with antimicrobials. And we're looking at now combining that with antimicrobials. So end, endogain in a flapless approach, non-surgically um, with antimicrobials. This is going to be the future, okay? Um, so the answer to your question is highly effective in um, uh, selected cases. So these are the cases that would score now uh, what we call grade C and definitely with multiple deep, over six millimeter pockets um, in a generalized sense, okay? So these are the cases that would highly benefit from antimicrobials. What we want to see in the future is how that compares to use of endogen in the flapless approach and endogen and antimicrobials as well. I hope that helps. Thank you very much, uh, very clear answer. The second question coming from Dr. Sheikh. I think in Cambridge, uh, talking about uh, or asking about the um, forcation management. And uh, as I understood from his question, he's asking whether uh, having a class one and two into class three through through would be an uh, effective type of management or uh, is good for the long term in terms of the efficacy and patient's management for the forcation lesion. Ah, um, very good question. Very comprehensive question. Okay, now let's let's divide that. So um, I would say uh, there's no argument that a grade one forcation lesion is not as problematic as two and three. Okay, um, grade two forcation lesion is the bit, bit, bit of a gray area. Um, and it really depends on um, uh, the site in the arch. If it's an upper or if it's a lower, if it's a six or a seven. Okay, so I'd be more concerned about uh, upper sevens, for example. Uh, they would have a poorer long-term prognosis uh, than a lower seven. Um, and also the root, uh, the, 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 how splayed the roots are. The more splayed they are, the more complicated it is to maintain cleanliness, but the more anchored the tooth is, so it's less likely to be mobile. Um, and what we don't want is a mobile tooth that's difficult to maintain. Um, and large, lastly, the class three forcation lesions, they tend to have a poor prognosis, okay? Um, I, I can cite a number of papers that looked at the long-term prognosis of grade three uh, forcations, and they're largely poor. Um, and it would be better to um, look at um, uh, replacing them or removing them to protect the ridge, for example. But this should always be taken um, uh, with a pinch of salt. It should always be compared to the patient's age. Okay, now we're in, the, we're, we're in an era that our classification takes into consideration the patient's age, i.e. the grading. Okay, so if the patient's elderly, they're likely to be a grade B or A. Therefore, heavy-handed 
um, removal of teeth with furcation lesions or heavy-handed management of teeth with furcation lesions other than just pure maintenance would be unwarranted. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, another question uh, from Lena Asoba mentioning about um, or actually asking about the distal um, of sevens and presence of eight. And what is she's asking that do we have, um, if we have got this condition and BPE, or, uh, BPE is four, do we mention that in the BPE or leave it as is? Um, right. Again, very good question, controversial. Um, uh, my view is always take the whole mouth. Agree. So uh, if you've got um, uh, an interproximal area of attachment loss elsewhere in the mouth, and then you've got that seven, but the rest of the mouth is pristine, then I probably wouldn't take that seven into consideration. If the patient uh, appears to be uh, of low risk uh, in terms of his lifestyle and his medical history. But if the patient's lifestyle or medical history is of concern, then I will probably include that seven in the diagnosis, okay? Therefore, making, it, uh, making the patient a case periodontitis to protect the patient because then um, if the patient is classed as a case periodontitis for having two or more non-adjacent teeth with um, clinical attachment loss, then all of a sudden the maintenance, the treatment, the supportive therapy is upscaled to protect them. So err on the side of safety. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pat, for the clear answer again. And there's another question from Salman Sheikh asking about the connective tissue grafts, uh, whether they be stable in high-risk patients or non-stable periodontally uh, patients, involved patients. They're all... Do you expect to retreat them or to regraft them? Okay. Uh, first of all, the, 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 I'm going to divide my answer into two um, um, uh, areas, looking at teeth and looking at dental implants. Okay. I think so, he's talking about a tooth, probably the canine tooth, the connective tissue graft. Yeah, the canine tooth, the, the ability of a connective tissue um, or the ability of soft tissue to survive in an area and maintain aesthetic and clinical function directly relates to what's underneath it, be it tooth or bone. So if the tooth surface loss progresses, the likelihood is the connective tissue graft or the area that was treated will be lost. Okay. Um, if there's, uh, if, 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 if the connective tissue graft was placed over an area resulting from inflammatory um, attachment loss and that inflammatory attachment loss, it, the cause for it is not managed appropriately, we would end up losing what we achieved. Excellent. Uh, I've had another question coming from <coughs> Joao Afonso uh, asking about case number 16 and how was, how was it managed? Uh, only restoratively and restoratively and dental implants? Yes. And um, yeah, that's his, uh, his question. Only, only restoratively, um, so with, with dental implants, uh, and I know Joao quite well, he's a, he's a fantastic uh, 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 budding prosthodontist. Um, so he's probably looking at my preps and thinking, oh, what a disaster. But um, uh, that, was, uh, that was my way of managing it. Um, did not need any periodontal treatment other than improving the margins, getting rid of caries, just good old uh, restorative dentistry um, um, and uh, replacing what cannot be mended. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Fahad. It's a clear uh, answer as well. Mel Nips asking about, would it be possible for connective tissue graft lost into dental papilla to reduce an unsightly black triangle due to the, due to the loss of papilla? Uh, oh, good, good question. Right. Um, I have seen it. Um, it was um, uh, clearly demonstrated in 2015 uh, in a case-based discussion led by a Turkish team. Uh, they subsequently published a case series where they demonstrated increase in um, a phenotype or a biotype um, with a knock-on effect of uh, causing papillary infill. Uh, so if you increase the buccal tissue, so we're not augmenting interproximally, just buccally, that can have a knock-on effect and increase 
uh, papillary infill. Uh, wow. I have seen it. It's poorly predictable. You know, you can't, you can't predict it very easily. No, definitely. Uh, um, uh, but it's definitely uh, worth a go if, if, if the area is upsetting the patients. Now, you've got to take that into consideration um, along with other um, emerging therapies like use of fillers, for example, um, um, uh, or uh, changing the contact point position um, or uh, orthodontic tooth movement um, uh, these are these are um, more uh, more or less could be you know uh, could be alternatives um, and and post brexit we might see other treatment modalities coming across from the states currently unallowed currently uh, prohibited in the uk such yeah. as use of cellular dermal matrices these are these have been uh, uh, clearly described by the group in texas yeah but um, some people are still using these adms uh, no, I know a few people in London and Liverpool are using ADMs a while ago. No, these are Especially cellular. The ones coming dermat- from the horizons, yes. Cellular matrices. Oh, what cellular, use, okay. What we use here is acellular. Yeah, okay, that's correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, second question, and another question actually coming from um, uh, Mark uh, Barden asking about the implant design. Do you have position? machined smooth collars on implants used in perio cases? Um, good question, Mark. Um, no. Um, right. So basically it's asking whether the smooth collars would help in terms of managing those who might be um, periodontally or might be periodontally involved in the near future or they have got some recurrence in the future. Um, I would... It's, it's, a, it's a good question whether we need to look into that or not. But um, at present, um, what I favor doing is using um, uh, implants with um, the ability to give me um, fair primary stability, um, uh, implants that have a connection platform that allows for a platform switch um, um, so that I preserve bone um, and uh, I use uh, the shortest possible implant to get uh, my, um, my required outcome uh, because I'm anticipating that if bone loss progresses, um, it's difficult to stop. I can stop it, um, but only for a period of time. Um, so the answer to your question, Mark, as to whether we ought to look at polished collars um, is a good one. Uh, but I'm going about it uh, in a different way. I'm just trying to look at preserving bone uh, and not worrying about when the bone loss happens and what I'm going to do to the implant. Fantastic answer. Thank you very much. Uh, just to add to this uh, short note on the uh, machine uh, colors, actually, I've got a trade off between bone and soft tissues. Bone likes. Um, uh, some sort of rough surface and for the osteoblast, but the fibroblast to the contrary, they like yeah. surface, polished surface. So it's quite it's difficult to achieve both objectives at the same design. And that's why we moved from the machine into rough and then from the rough to the micro roughness, or they call it the laser treated type next to produce a problem. If, um, and, and, and I'm, just, I'm just going to be really geeky here and just jump in at, and, and clarify one point. So yeah. A polished color is different from a machined color. So a polished color is completely pristinely smooth and that will not encourage any osteointegration. Yes, and that is probably compatible or similar to the designs introduced by Straumann, the soft tissue level implants. Tissue level, yeah. tissue yeah. level implants. Right, okay, thank you very much. Just I'd like to put a few questions forward, might be some food for thoughts for the evening and for future uh, webinars, but I think it's, uh, it's now time to close the session. But I'd like to put some questions for the audience and for Dr. Fahad. Um, I receive few myself these questions from myself. I receive um, some referrals from colleagues, periodontists, prosthodontists, orthodontists, talking about the management of occlusal trauma as they are worried about uh, periodontal disease. And Fahad alluded on this subject. Uh, I don't want to answer any questions, just to uh, these are some food, uh, I think, uh, questions for the future webinars, a food for thought for the future. So the impact of occlusal trauma on the uh, health of periodontium and whether they are primary cause of periodontal disease. Uh, I do receive some referrals as well uh, about uh, 
putting or treating recession around implants and I think that could you need to be careful not to treat it as periodontitis or recession could be attributed to malpositioning and malpositioning is the primary factor for more of the complications we might see but I think somebody Hopefully, we'll talk about this in the future. And I'll also ask uh, Fad about some of the cases he presented, and I can see some poor RCTs um, and some lesions or some bone loss around them. I saw in the Amsterdam meeting some cases managed by having elective sometimes RCTs. So I was wondering whether elective RCTs and sharing that with our endodontist colleague might improve the outcome. And last question, or uh, I think the adjunctive antimicrobial therapy, what sort of regime, what sort of dose, and where about to use it, and how strict should we be, uh, should we, uh, be about the non-surgical management, about the timing of the treatment uh, in the light of the uh, old evidence, the new evidence emerging, and all the research being published recently. And uh, last thing, I would say the design of the restorations and the importance of having posterior support in terms of reducing the splaying and the mobility of anterior teeth. I think if any of the audience would have some answers, would be very good. But I'll try to uh, invite Bad again if he can offer us another webinar because this is quite comprehensive and big topic. So if he could kindly offer us in probably breaking this big webinar into small webinars, two, three webinars, during this period and also uh, during the summertime. I think that would be great. Yeah, uh, no problem. Uh, It'll be a pleasure. It's 22 hours. Thank you very much, Fad. I think hopefully, I think we're going to close this session now. Uh, if anybody has got a question, please write it to me. Uh, you can uh, write an email to ramid at hotmail.com. It's R-O-M-E-E-D at hotmail.com or to the London Little Academy, which is courses at lda.academy. And I think Dr. Fad, also, if you've got any questions, I can pass it on to him. Thank you very much, guys, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Bye now.